While the Trump administration tries to pump up the coal industry, the need for it here in New England is dying with the closure of the last coal-fired power plant in Massachusetts. Now as I look at it, I see the future and the future right now isn't very bright. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankosky. As coal moves out, those same towns are looking to offshore wind as a possible bright future. We'll also ask, what's day-to-day life like for an undocumented farm worker in Vermont's dairy industry? When you don't understand the language, you feel isolated. You feel isolated because all the owners, the people we work for, they can't explain anything to you. And we'll take a look back at how the AIDS crisis impacted Provincetown. You know, you had to push a lot of the feelings aside just so you could function. And I think that for many years after that, I was traumatized. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Next. I'm John Dankosky. Donald Trump wants to bring coal production back to America, but here in New England, the need for it is dwindling. The last coal-fired power plant in Massachusetts, and the largest one in New England, shut down for good at the end of May. Now just three coal-powered plants are left in our region. Two are in New Hampshire, one's in Connecticut, and the Connecticut plant is scheduled to close in 2021. For more than 50 years, the massive Brayton Point power station in Somerset, Massachusetts, has generated electricity fueled by shiploads of coal from as far away as Colombia and South Africa. The shutdown marks a victory for environmentalists, but pulling the plug on this plant leaves a huge hole in Somerset's tax base and potentially a bigger problem for ratepayers across the region. From WBUR, Bruce Gellerman has our story. The Marshland Deepwater Port at the southern tip of Somerset has been the site for coal shipments for 150 years. The Black Rock once helped power a young nation's trains, industrial revolution, and fueled its optimism. Brayton Point's two cement cooling towers, each soaring 500 feet high, loom in the distance across Mount Hope Bay. For State Representative Pat Haddad, the bay's name is now a misnomer. It's very melancholy because what it represented for the town of Somerset for a very long time was an industry that was responsible for a large portion of the tax base. Now as I look at it, I see the future and the future right now isn't very bright. In its heyday, hundreds of workers stoked the coal-burning boilers at Brayton Point. The plant generated enough electricity to power a million and a half homes and fueled Somerset schools and services with $13 million a year. But for the past decade, it's produced a declining fraction of the power and funds. Many area residents worry about what will happen when the plug is finally pulled on the plant later today. But Lloyd Mendes, not so much. What do I do? I, I'm, a, I'm a nudnik in town. Mendes is retired. He recently ran unsuccessfully for Somerset Selectman. His unpopular solution to save money after the shutdown, deep spending cuts, reduce school bus service, and eliminate the Blue Raiders high school hockey program. I love hockey. I recognize that these kids are a unique bunch of kids. Maybe some of them are at risk. I mean, it's a wonderful sport, but we cannot afford 1500 bucks per kid. For, for any activity. Mendes lives near Mount Hope Bay in the shadow of the Brayton Point cooling towers. I get kayaks, I get a sailboat, I shellfish. Uh, it's a beautiful place. And the fact that it's next to industry, well, I, you know, I live in the industrial age. I, I get no problem with that. Nobody owes you a living. I mean, it's up to, it's up to you to make things work. And, and don't forget, it, the Sierra Club didn't force them out. They made a business decision. Environmental demonstrators tried for years to shut Brayton Point down. The coal plant was the state's number one emitter of toxins into the environment, and hot water discharged into the bay was killing fish. A decade ago, plant owner Dominion Energy spent a billion dollars to clean up its act and comply with court orders. But it was too little, too late. Peter Shattuck, director of the Acadia Center's Clean Energy Initiative, says Dominion didn't realize there was a revolution going on in energy production, away from coal to natural gas, renewable resources, and efficiency. The owners really got caught flat-footed, though. They poured a ton of money into that, 
facility and then basically had to drop it a couple of years later. In 2014, Dominion sold Brayton Point to the private equity firm Energy Capital Partners. The company, based in New Jersey but incorporated in the Cayman Islands, bought the plant and two others for less than half the price Dominion paid for the environmental improvements. And then, just six weeks after the deal closed, Energy Capital Partners announced it was closing Brayton Point in three years. State Representative Pat Haddad. You know, it's still a mystery. Uh, Very many of us have the conjecture that the group that bought the plant from Dominion really had no plan to run it. For them, it just meant how quickly can we move it along and how much can we make. Energy Capital Partners was able to make a lot more money selling less power. They knew that when they bought Brayton Point. Tyson Slocum investigated the strange deal. He's director of the Energy Project at the consumer advocacy organization Public Citizen. He charges Energy Capital Partners deliberately manipulated the wholesale market for electricity, single-handedly turning the region's energy supply from a surplus to a deficit. Their whole plan was to buy Preyton Point so that they could prematurely close it in order to create this artificial shortage to drive prices up. Prices went up by more than a billion dollars. A huge price increase, all to be paid for by New England ratepayers. It's exactly what Enron did. Energy Capital Partners did not respond to numerous attempts to discuss the Brayton Point deal. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission reviewed the case. Two of four commissioners raised concerns about market manipulation, but because of the split, didn't pursue further investigation. ISO New England manages the region's wholesale electricity market, Spokeswoman Ann George declined to discuss specifics about Brayton Point, but says the market responded as expected. Yes, yes, that is true. That's what markets do when they see a shortfall. The prices rise to show the need for investment. Power generators wanted to invest in more natural gas power plants. Bargain basement prices for frack gas were driving other energy sources out of the market. Ann George says closing the Brayton Point coal plant creates even greater demand for gas. And so you take away a large non-gas resource, and that just adds to the pressure for natural gas on the current natural gas system. In the year 2000, coal supplied 12% of New England's electricity. Now it's just 3%. And natural gas, which generated less than 20% of the region's energy back then, now provides nearly 60%. And the ISO says we need more natural gas and more pipelines to carry it to ensure the reliable supply of electricity. We're putting all our eggs in a big natural gas basket, and it's risky. Acadia Center's Peter Shattuck warns we've become dangerously over-reliant on natural gas to generate electricity. He says we need alternatives. Brayton is a a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to show that we can go straight from coal to clean energy. We know how to do this. We have the tools, offshore wind, energy storage. These are the technologies of the future. We just need to use them in a smart way to make the grid stronger. You know, when I saw the handwriting on the wall, I realized that, you know, honey, you got to, you know, do something or get off the train because it's going to be wrecked. Somerset State Rep Pat Haddad had been the biggest booster of Brayton Point, but now Massachusetts is mandating new offshore wind farms produce as much electricity as the coal-fired power plant once did. Her dad is a convert. She wants to use Brayton Point as a support site for the offshore wind farms. Wind makes so much sense. I mean, it's 300-plus acres on the water. We are a designated deep water port. What we have for transmission lines. So I think the opportunities are there. So, yes, I'm the schizophrenic. I was the queen of coal, and now I'm the witch of wind. <laughs> And as the sun set on the old Somerset coal-fired power plant, in sight is a new horizon. The day after Brayton Point closed, Massachusetts officials met with members of renewable energy companies to assess three coastal sites that are in the running to be the hub of the new offshore wind industry, including Brayton Point. That's Bruce Gellerman reporting. For more on coal's demise in New England and the promise of offshore wind, we turn to Ben Storo, who covers energy for Energy and Environment News. Ben, welcome back to Next. Thanks for having me. 
So the future, perhaps, is offshore wind, which we'll talk about in a moment. The past is coal. That past is almost completely gone in New England. How much coal was being used to produce electricity in New England up until recently? New England, for a long time now, has not been as coal dependent on other parts of the country. The Midwest, Texas, coal accounts for big parts of their electricity generation. And around 2000, if my memory serves, in New England, about 16% of its electricity was coming from coal. Last year, that was 2%. And that's because nuclear, by and large, makes up a big part of the, uh, of the picture in a way that it doesn't in some other parts of the country. The, the coal that was being burned, that made of that 2% uh, very, very recently, soon to be zero, it wasn't the primary source of power, though. Uh, plants like this plant in Somerset were, were kicking on at times of peak energy demand. So talk about what happens next. If, if coal's not being burned whenever we're all running our air conditioners in the middle of the summertime, what's happening instead? wind developers and hydro developers are competing for uh, what will be a guaranteed contract. And that could secure sort of a portion of this backup power supply that we need. It could be used at other times too. Other folks think that uh, that's not a very good way of doing things. Um, They'd prefer New England has a wholesale electricity market and they have an auction where people uh, put in bids uh, to, to serve sort of that backup role If you left it to the market, we'd probably get even more natural gas in New England, which is already around 50% of uh, power generation. But to do that, you'd need more pipelines. And as I know you know well, John, that's a controversial subject up there. If we don't have natural gas to burn and we're not going to burn coal, we're maybe going to rely increasingly on renewables to fill this little bit of a gap. But the thing people always say about renewables is, they're not as consistent. We don't know when the sun's going to shine. We don't know when the wind's going to blow. That's not the same as just turning on a coal plant and firing it up. Hydropower, you could turn on almost any time. That doesn't have that that restraint. Um, wind and solar, of course, do. Offshore wind is interesting in the sense that um, power sector wonks, they talk about these things in terms of, they call them capacity factors. And basically all that means is how often does the power plant run? Offshore wind, they project, will have a capacity factor of 50%, which is actually pretty high. So offshore wind could do some heavy lifting, but as you said, you're, you're still going to need that natural gas. You're still going to need uh, nuclear power and, and maybe some of these, even some of these old uh, oil and, and coal units. One of the things that we have here in New England is the ISO New England power grid, all these states connected together. The problem seems to be that when a state like Massachusetts goes out and says, we want to procure a certain type of energy, whether it's offshore wind or we want to bring in hydropower from Quebec, the interests of Massachusetts may be at odds with the interests of ISO New England or the rest of the New England states. I'm wondering how you see those things play out. As Massachusetts sets energy policy, is that possibly bad for the entire New England region or complicating it at least? It's sort of like imagine a game of musical chairs and imagine that one chair gets guaranteed to offshore wind and everybody else has to compete for the remaining chairs people aren't going to be happy about that. So with that one chair being set aside for offshore wind, where are we now? Talk about the possible developments off the coast here of southern Massachusetts, these these towns of, of Somerset and, and New Bedford, and, and what they might do to get into the offshore wind market. So these towns, what's really interesting about these towns is they, they, they see a, a version of themselves in Europe, uh, the Humber region of England, uh, some German fishing ports where, where they've seen the decline of the fishing industry and, and just really had fallen on hard times. Those communities in recent years have sort of positioned themselves uh, to become real hubs for the offshore wind industry. They've, they've attracted manufacturing jobs or operations and maintenance hub. And so New Bedford and, and southern Massachusetts is looking at that going, huh, that makes sense. We can do that. The reason they think that they can do that is because they are the closest industrial port to the wind fields south of Martha's Vineyard. And so they think that if you take their marine know-how, you know, obviously these are people that know how to work on the on the North Atlantic and combine it with the proximity that they're they're the ones who could really benefit if these turbines get built. 
Obviously, a lot of people think that this could provide an economic boost to the region. There are a lot of skeptics, too. What are they saying? They're the folks who say that this competitive bid process really isn't competitive, that it's effectively shut out uh, other people who might be interested. That's basically other power plant owners. And they've threatened the possibility of a lawsuit. So that's one batch of skeptics. Fishermen are are worried about um, what this will mean for them. And then I think, you know, a lot of people in New England will remember Cape Wind, you know, how that turned out. And I think it's fair to say are just generally skeptical. And the big Cape Wind project you refer to to be built off of Cape Cod. But the the big concerns there was it was going to ruin the the sight lines of, of the beach. It was going to take away something very important about what Cape Cod is supposed to be. Are you hearing some of those voices as well in this more, let's say, industrial area of, of New England? These new developments are so far offshore that no one can see them. So they're not going to generate the type of onshore opposition that you saw from Cape Wind. Uh, secondly, when Cape Wind was being proposed, there was no federal leasing process for siting wind turbines in the ocean. And now there is. And, and, and these leases have gone through a lot of mapping. So they've tried to put them outside of the fishing grounds. They've tried to put them outside of shipping lanes. They've tried to keep them out of migratory paths of birds and whales. I don't want to say that those concerns don't exist anymore, but it, they're not to the same level as they might have been with Cape Wind. And most importantly, maybe the biggest difference is that the turbines being used today are so much bigger. They're, they're right now double the size. So Cape Wind could produce 3.6 megawatts of wind. The turbines being used in, in Europe today, they range from 6 to 8 megawatts, and, and people are talking about going up to 10 and that's really important because you can achieve a, an economy of scale with a, a larger turbine and produce power for less. That's the bottom line. Of course, the problem with wind all along has been people say it's very expensive to produce, very expensive to maintain. And the further you put these wind assets offshore, Ben, the the more it takes to get the energy back. Are, are they going to be cost efficient to run these transmission lines way out into the water? Yeah, that's an interesting question. They actually think that it will be easier to do the transmission from the ocean than uh, onshore. Permitting new power lines in New England, which is just so densely populated, is really difficult. And by contrast, you know, you're talking about 14 to 20 miles off the shore of Massachusetts. The grand hope, there's a number of options, but bringing it back to Brayton Point, the power plant in Somerset, People would like to, um, I think, optimally land those transmission lines at Brayton Point. And then it's not far to Boston and Providence and other lo- load centers in New England. Ben Storrow from Energy and Environment News, thanks so much for joining us again. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up, life on a Vermont dairy farm for immigrant farm workers. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. Recent estimates suggest that there are about 1,400 foreign-born Latino workers and their family members in Vermont. The state's agriculture industry relies heavily on these workers, most of whom are in the country illegally. With an increase in deportations for non-criminal immigrants since the beginning of Donald Trump's presidency back in January, many farm workers are on edge. In March, the Vermont legislature passed a law that limits the ability of local law enforcement to work with federal immigration authorities. And that same month, ICE arrested three immigration activists in Burlington. Against this backdrop, a listener named Hannah Lindner Finley submitted a question to the Brave Little State podcast from Vermont Public Radio. And she wondered, what's it like to be a migrant worker in Vermont? As VPR reporter Kathleen Masterson learned, it's not a one-size-fits-all experience. Here's an excerpt from the latest episode of Brave Little State. It's 10.30 a.m. on a Friday morning, and Gregorio's still groggy-eyed with sleep. He checks the soccer scores on his smartphone before he heads into his next 12-hour shift. He lives with six co-workers in an old farmhouse right next to the dairy barn. Inside, it feels a bit like a college frat house, except no one here has much time for fraternizing. Here, it's all work. The entryway is full of well-worn rubber boots, and there are work garments hanging to dry on the porch. 
The living room windows are covered with dark fabric to block the light, because many in the house work night shifts. There's a TV, a dartboard, and a couch covered in laundry and several guitars. Nothing here came easy. When he was 20, Gregorio spent $4,500 to cross the Mexican border. He walked for a week to get to a safe house in Tucson, Arizona. That was four years ago. Now he's here, on this farm in central Vermont, spending his early 20s working 12-hour shifts six days a week. I'd like to leave to play soccer, but when I'm free, the others are working, and when others are free, I'm working. So it's only on Saturday afternoons when I get to play soccer. Saturdays are his days off. Saturdays, I don't do anything on the farm. I'm just here at the house, listening to music, talking to my mom on the phone, sometimes, not every week. <laughs> Overall, Gregorio says he likes living in Vermont. The money is way more than he could make in Mexico, and he says he's grown accustomed to the daily routines. But he says it's hard being stuck on the farm. We're only here to work. It's isolating to always have to be here at the ranch. The situation doesn't permit us to visit cities here in the U.S., to interact with society. But I think it's part of our life, to be isolated. Gregorio says he's made peace with this. But it's worth it, because many friends of my age in Mexico, they have family, they have kids, and it's really hard. They don't have money. They tell me, you're here. You have good opportunities to make a house, to do things. Yes, but also, I sacrificed everything to be here. They have nothing because they haven't sacrificed anything. I sacrificed my youth. There are many things I'd like back at home. Fishing, parties, fun. During all this, I stayed here. Gregorio tells me it's too stressful to invest much in the life in the U.S. He could lose everything in a second. We're illegals. So in any moment, immigration could detain me and send me to Mexico. Instead, he lives life so that if he's deported, the only thing he'll lose is the job, and the only thing he'll take with him are his clothes. But just a half mile down the road, Gregorio's co-worker, Francisco, is invested here. But he didn't expect that to happen when he first came to the U.S. When I left my country, my plan was to spend a year in the U.S. I was studying to be a lawyer in a Mexican university. I wanted to be independent from my family. I wanted to work for one year and to save enough money to finish the three years I had left in school. But one year turned into ten, and instead of practicing law, Francisco is working on the same farm as Gregorio. Francisco isn't his real name. We've changed it to protect his privacy. Part of the reason Francisco is still here is that he met someone. Ten years ago, shortly after arriving in rural New York, where he found work on a dairy farm, he fell in love and started a family. It was never my plan to form a family here, but now I have a family, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, why I stayed. Francisco has an eight-year-old daughter now, and he feels pretty comfortable in Vermont. But it was a long road to get to this point. Francisco says the hardest thing about coming to a new country and learning an entirely new job was doing all of that without knowing English. When you don't understand the language, you feel isolated. You feel isolated because all the owners, the people we worked for, they can't explain anything to you. They can't tell you anything or ask you anything. And we also couldn't communicate with them. The situation made me feel isolated, even depressed. Imagine showing up to your first day of work and not understanding your boss. Francisco did eventually teach himself some English, but he still wanted to do this interview in Spanish. He says when he first got here and was living in rural New York, he sometimes felt disrespected, but he heard worse things about Vermont. I had a friend who had been here longer than me. He always said that when people went to stores in Vermont, in Bennington to be specific, ICE would grab people from there. They picked people up in stores, or on one occasion they grabbed someone from a hospital. 
So he gave the impression that Vermont was a difficult place for immigrants to live. That if you were in Vermont, you would surely get grabbed by immigration and sent back to Mexico. And it turned out that happened to Francisco, too. Almost. Here's how it happened. Even though Bennington had a bad reputation, Francisco ended up moving there. Because that's where his girlfriend lived. She's his wife now. She's a Vermonter. He met her at the wire transfer company where she worked. So one day in 2009, Francisco says the Bennington police came to their apartment. What happened next wasn't uncommon in those early years of the Obama administration. We only have Francisco's account of what happened that day. But basically, he says the police came because they got in a call from the neighbors who were concerned that his daughter was crying. Nothing came of that, but the police told Francisco they had a few more questions for him and wanted to take him down to the station. It would just take 45 minutes, they said. He agreed. At the station, the police questioned him about his immigration status and then locked him in a cell for about three hours. Francisco says he later realized three hours is exactly how long it takes for ICE officials to drive down from their office in Swanton. ICE arrived and then brought him back to Swanton for more questioning. Ultimately, they placed him in a detention facility in Buffalo, New York. This month and a half was, I think, the most difficult of all my life. At the time, his daughter was two, and Francisco knew if he were deported, he would be forbidden from re-entering the U.S. for 10 years. So I was thinking what would happen in this 10-year window. Obviously, I could bring my daughter to Mexico, but it's not the same as seeing her every day, just two or three times a year. So that's what killed me mentally, emotionally, but I couldn't know what was going to happen. In that month, I only slept one or two hours a night because I was thinking about what might happen, and I couldn't sleep. In the end, Francisco got help from an immigration lawyer and letters of support from the community, and a judge stayed his deportation. And even though Francisco is married now, and he says he's authorized to work here, he still doesn't have the same rights as a U.S. citizen. Yeah, I'm secure. I can never be 100% secure, because with the new president, anything can happen. I still always act with caution in everything I do, because we immigrants, they have us in a position where whatever error that we might commit, that means you're not good. You're not good people. So I always try to be. How should I say this? As careful as possible in everything I do. So to put it simply, you always have to be an example, I suppose. Gregorio and Francisco's stories come to us from Brave Little State, the people-powered podcast from Vermont Public Radio. Kathleen Masterson's the reporter who interviewed Gregorio and Francisco. She's been covering immigration in Vermont for us. We wanted to know more about the economic forces that drive farm workers to make the journey from Mexico to New England. So we brought Kathleen into the studio. Welcome back to Next. Thanks, John. Good to be here. So these people that you've profiled here, they both risked an awful lot to get into the United States. They intended to stay here for just a a short period of time, but uh, they've been here working. Uh, How big is the financial incentive for them to keep working here in the U.S.? That was one of the things I tried to get at in in questioning them, um, because it really is a huge risk and a big cost uh, to pay someone to cross over the border. And the short answer is that they can definitely make a lot more money here in the U.S. than in Mexico. I heard salaries ranging anywhere from $7 an hour to, with more experience, $12 an hour. By comparison, I had just looked up the average salaries in, in Veracruz, Mexico. And this jives with what some of the workers told me, because a bunch of them are from that state. And that's about $1,300 a month. Um, Whereas if they're working $10 an hour in the U.S., 11-hour shifts, six days a week, that's more like $2,600 a month. And they're not paying rent here in the U.S. They're only paying for their food and their cell phone. And frankly, because as you heard, so many of them rarely leave the farm, they're really not spending a lot of money um, in the U.S., And we can note, just looking historically over the last few decades, that the influx of Mexican immigrants, people crossing illegally into the country, um, does kind of correspond with the Mexican economy. We started seeing a real influx in the 80s, and then it just spiked way up in the 90s. And and some economists would even specifically blame um, the impact of NAFTA on the rural economy in Mexico. Many subsistence farmers were surviving off their farms, growing corn. But with NAFTA, there was a huge influx of subsidized corn from the U.S. So uh, many really lost their income there. And, And 
we did start to see a spike of, of workers really high in the 90s and 2000s. It leveled out a little, and there was a little bit of a um, downturn in 2008 with the U.S. economy having a downturn. So even with a fairly modest amount of income by U.S. standards, they're making a lot more money than they would back home in Mexico. But as you've reported, Kathleen, these are not easy jobs. These are jobs with very long hours and in very hard work. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I've had multiple farm owners tell me that it's really hard to find American workers who are willing to work through the night, those shifts, weekend shifts, um, and frankly, without asking for overtime and other other things an American worker would have the right to ask for. That's another of the risks um, or downsides to being a legal worker is that you really don't have a recourse if you're asked to work overtime or if a farmer doesn't pay um, one of the dairy workers for several weeks. Um, they can basically say, well, fine, report it, and you'll just get deported. In the political discourse about immigration in America, you hear a lot of people talking about uh, workers from Mexico, like like these gentlemen, coming and taking American jobs, not pulling their weight, being a drain on the economy. What do we really know about the the role of undocumented immigrants in the American economy? And, And are they putting in more than they're taking out? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, you know, the first thing to clear up is that the idea that immigrants don't pay taxes, that's simply not true. The majority of immigrants do. That's That includes people here without authorization. Um, part of that stems from the fact that employers require a social security number, um, some paperwork f- to work for them. Employers don't want to be penalized for employing someone who's illegal. So they have a semblance of paperwork um, that makes everything look good on the books. Um, And that means that people are paying into Social Security and other taxes. So just a recent stat from Vermont in 2012, unauthorized immigrants paid $5.8 million in state and local taxes. That's from the American Immigration Council. So that's a pretty hefty amount for a small state um, that doesn't have as large an immigrant population as other states. And I spoke with some workers and I also spoke with an immigration attorney who's, who's dealt with a lot of deportation cases. And basically the, the deal is that a lot of people will pay some kind of dealer, if you will, to uh, buy a social security number. They either can buy that one that turns out to be a real one or they can be effectively borrowing someone's with permission, paying to buy one. And uh, that's called a ghost worker because the real owner of the social security number isn't working, but they're willing to lend out their social security number because they're going to reap the money paid into it. And basically, you never run into trouble, this was what the lawyer told me, unless um, you've ta- you've effectively taken someone's social security number without them knowing it, and they find out. So it's actually relatively easy to get a social security number. Um, one farmer I spoke with just paid $150 to use an American person's number, and he, he found that gentleman through, uh, for lack of a better word, through a, a dealer, someone his friends told him to contact to buy a number. What do we know about the role of the farm owners, the, the ones who actually employ these immigrant workers, Kathleen? Because most of them must know where these workers are coming from. Are they just looking the other way when they have people coming from Mexico with potentially fake IDs showing up to work on their farms? Right. Good question. From the people I've spoken with, that that's farm owners. Um, they are fully aware that um, their workers are not here legally. Um, they know that in part because they've told me that the the waves of fear that have passed through the community and some of their workers are scared to open the door because they think it might be immigration. From what I've heard and from the lawyers I've spoken with, it's actually relatively rare that an employer would be penalized, especially you know if you're only having a handful of workers. Um, so um, it's really a tacit understanding that I'm taking the social security number, I'm filling out the paperwork, and it's almost a, a don't ask, don't tell situation. And they're not running any background checks um, to see that this person is in the country legally, and therefore they can claim ignorance effectively. You talked earlier about the history of NAFTA and how that may have contributed to the economic conditions in Mexico that has been sending some farm workers north to the United States. Let's talk a little bit more about the history of farms like these relying on workers from Mexico for, for its labor. Tell us a bit about what you know. There was previously a program that allowed Mexican guest workers to work on U.S. farms. It was short-term labor contracts. Um, It's called the Braceros Program, which literally means like people who work with their arms, laborers. Um, And it grew out of World War II when there was a concern that there'd be a shortage of American workers. So that program actually ran from 1942 to 1964. And in those years, 4.6 million Mexicans were admitted to the U.S., mostly to do farm work. And uh, again, like any programs that have been pitched nowadays, 
days, that program wasn't without controversy. Um, there were strikes at the time over wages. There were arguments that people weren't being paid fairly um, about housing conditions. It ultimately fizzled out in the early 1960s. Um, but the idea of creating some kind of guest worker program has certainly been kept politically alive, even though it hasn't happened yet. Vermont Senator Leahy, along with California Senator Feinstein, they recently introduced the Agricultural Worker Program Act, and that is uh, an act that would try to shield farm workers from deportation and put them on a path to earn legal status and maybe even citizenship. Um, That has not gone through, but there is a companion house bill uh, that has also been introduced. But the reality is that unless you're a seasonal worker, there's really not a pathway for farm workers who want to be here year-round, especially for some of our industries that require year-round work, like dairies and like slaughterhouses. But you did meet uh, at least one worker who is in the country legally. That's right, I did. Um, On the same farm that employed some illegal farm workers, I spoke with uh, a man named Marseille, and he was able to get legal work authorization, which is incredibly rare. Uh, And he thinks that because of his unique situation, that's the main reason he was granted authorization. Let's listen to a bit of the story. The farm manager came up to me and asked me how I wanted to be referred to. I said, I prefer that you call me a man rather than a woman. And they said, yeah, well, the work here is long and it's for men. And I said to myself, I like the work. Marseille says he was born in a woman's body, but his identity is as a man. He says he's always been open with his family about this, and they've accepted and loved him. And I've always done men's work. It doesn't seem like a chore to me. I practically spent my youth on a ranch with my parents and my sisters, so I'm not scared of the work here. I like it. And unlike many other Vermont dairy workers born in Mexico, Marseille actually has legal authorization to work in the U.S. for the whole year, not just seasonally. He says that some of his friends have speculated that he was granted authorization because of his sexual identity. My friends told me maybe it's because here they help people of my sex, of my preferences, you could say. They say maybe that's why the immigration officials gave me the permit, because in my country it's not accepted. Well, just barely. Whereas here in the U.S., it's more accepted. So perhaps this is why they gave me the papers. That's what many people have told me. Regardless, he wasn't going to pass up the opportunity. He says he likes living in Vermont, the clean air, being in nature, working with animals. Like Gregorio, Marseille came to the U.S. to support family back home. His two younger siblings were studying in school. I miss my family, but they're the reason I'm here. When you live in a rural area, it's hard to get higher level learning. So I'm doing this for my siblings. I'm here to help them have the chance to study what they want. Marseille also has a partner back home. He calls her his wife, and they talk every day. Since I get to talk to her when I finish working, she's there on the video calls. So I don't miss her too much. Maybe you miss your family a little bit more than if they were there in person, but not as much because we talk every day. Then there are times when suddenly you get sad for a few moments, but outside of that, it's all good. For now, Marseille likes working in Vermont, and will try to get his authorization permit renewed in September. That's Kathleen Masterson reporting for the Vermont Public Radio podcast, Brave Little State. In the full episode, you'll also hear from vegetable pickers from Jamaica who have visas to work seasonally here in the U.S. You can listen at bravelittlestate.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us, Kathleen. Thanks, John. Coming up, what happened when a seaside resort town became a hotspot in a global epidemic? It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Melville Charitable Trust, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of housing and homelessness. When the AIDS epidemic hit the country back in the 1980s, Provincetown, Massachusetts, long a haven for New England's LGBT community, was hit especially hard. In the first 15 years of the crisis, 10% of the town's year-round population died. The Provincetown Cultural Council recently announced plans to move forward with an AIDS memorial there, something that has been in the works for years. Freelance producer Sophie Cases spoke with survivors about what they lost, what they built, and the impact of AIDS on this small, close-knit beach town. A warning to you, this piece contains some language that listeners might find offensive. Oh, it was a seismic earthquake. It seemed like people were grabbing at straws to define what this was. There was a certain level of panic. And that was part of the fear. We didn't know what it was or how it was transmitted. The rumble started slowly. 
It was 1982 when things began to change in Provincetown. The small beach community at the tip of Cape Cod was home to many LGBTQ people. It was also a popular vacation spot, a kind of artsy gay mecca. Couples held hands and ate ice cream, buskers and drag queens lined Commercial Street, and rainbow flags tussled in the wind. But beneath this lightness, something had shifted. The first case of AIDS had just been identified, and young gay men were getting sick. I remember when it became apparent that this was a real killer. I had this moment, this revelation that most of my friends are going to die. And it was, like, sad and profound all at the same time where you just thought, this is going to change everything. And it did. It totally did. By 1990, there were almost 200 reported cases of HIV and AIDS in Provincetown, and there were still no effective medications. The numbers grew and grew. Where family members and people that we know hardly knew anybody at all that were dying, we knew two and three people a week that were dying for years. We go to an event, and there'd be four of us in a car, and we'd have a conversation, who's going to be next? You know, and you you would think, well, I'm feeling this, so I'll probably be next, is what you'd think. Or you'd look over at the next guy, and he's skinnier than I am, so maybe he's going to be next. AIDS was a visible disease. Emaciated men sat on town benches. Many suffered from Kaposi sarcoma, which were cancerous skin legions that would grow together into large purple blotches. One person described his friend's skin as almost wood-like. He said you could knock and hear a dense sound. All this and more was happening in Provincetown, a major tourist destination. Sick men stood in stark contrast to carefree vacationers shopping for taffy and t-shirts. We used to have one electrical hospital bed. And I remember pushing this bed down Commercial Street with all these people coming at me, you know what I mean? Well, first of all, they're looking at me like, why is this going on? But they're all in shorts, you know, they're all, they're on vacation, you know, which, and I thought, this is the weirdest thing that's happening, you know? So you have this town of like merriment and whale watching, but you also have this huge heavy duty thing going on in it at the same time. There was already plenty of homophobia in the 80s and 90s, and the AIDS epidemic, new, mysterious, and feared, ramped up even more aggressive discrimination and anti-gay violence. At the time in New York City, it was just hysteria. The morality in our society said to me that I deserve to die. You do what you do and you deserve to get what you get. Just throw these drugs down those faggots' mouth and kill them and then they'll be quiet. That's exactly the attitude in the late 80s. It certainly was. Here, because this is a gay town, this is much more forgiving and much more accepting. And that stigma, it wasn't overt here. Because Provincetown was a refuge, many people with HIV and AIDS moved there to live out their last days. So officially in March of 1988, I tested positive for HIV. And I knew that what I wanted to do was to die in a community that would care for me and not treat me like a leper, not throw me in the gutter. And this town afforded death with dignity because you knew that the people who were around you would care for you. That's what I saw. Provincetown is small, only 3,500 year-round residents. And back then, the community was really tight-knit. People here say it would have been almost impossible not to know someone affected by the disease. At one point, this town had the second highest number of people with AIDS per capita in the country. If you think you're not affected by this, you are so wrong because it's the guy down the street, it's the guy who works in your supermarket, it's somebody that you know that you're not aware of. And that made it different. It was hard to look away, and that wasn't Provincetown style. Community members, nurses, business owners, clergy, and activists all came together to confront the crisis at hand. They mobilized, and the town became a role model for caring for people with HIV and AIDS. At the center of this response was the Provincetown AIDS Support Group. The support group was very lucky. We had a very good leader who was Alice Foley. She was the town nurse. She was a wild, brazen, pugnacious advocate. 
she was like a big mother to all of us. She wore red Converse. And she used to say to us all the time, we are creating the wheel. Because her way was to push it in people's face, make them talk about it. How do you prevent from getting it? The medications that are used, compassion, unconditional loving. What happens when you drop somebody? Alice's great words were, pick them up and get them back in bed and carry on. The community came together to bring dignity to the dying. Volunteers bathed friends, cleaned houses, and drove a weekly van to Boston for doctor's appointments. The amount of effort that everybody put in and love and compassion was truly astounding. The women at this town were terrific. The lesbians that helped out, they really, really rallied and came to the forefront um, when a lot of the men were really just struggling to stay alive or struggling to figure out what to do next. All this effort was to help people live out their final days with care and comfort. And they threw huge fundraisers to pay for medical bills and housing. You would think that a place that experienced death like that would be, you know, very sober and very, you know, reticent about celebration. Oh, that's crap. Who do you think raised the goddamn money? It was drag queens. All the events in Provincetown, it was always hosted by a drag queen. It was always drag queens performing. They were the energy. They were the life force. They were that way of throwing the pain of the world right back in the world's face and making us eat it up and laugh. Hundreds of people died, 10% of Provincetown's year-round population. But then, in 1996, a new class of drugs called protease inhibitors became available. They weren't magic pills, but the new drugs prolonged life for many. It was like a sudden screech and halt in the whole process. And it was almost like, you know, people standing on the precipice of a cliff and then some still tottered over and the others didn't. There were a lot of people who, if they did lived one month longer, they would have been living today. But there was a price to be paid, and there still is a price to be paid with every medication a person with AIDS takes. In the decade after protease inhibitors came out, that contrast between breezy tourists and thin AIDS patients out on a town bench started to diminish. Things were calming down. But for those who made it through, it was complicated. And the survivor's guilt, I think it was probably, for me, one of the toughest parts that I dealt with inwardly that I didn't talk about a lot, because how can you talk about the fact that you survived? How can you not be happy for that? Well, when you think you're going to be the only one left, it's hard. Yeah. You know, you had to push a lot of the feelings aside just so you could function. And I think that for many years after that, I was traumatized. A lot of dreams, nightmares. But I think as time has gone on, it's diminished a lot. I mean, it doesn't haunt me anymore, but it used to. Many survivors say they feel profound gratitude for the gift of time they were given. I think one of the things that people with illnesses often do is retreat into the illness, and it becomes the entirety of their existence. And yes, there is that kind of weight associated with many illnesses. But I also believe, though, that if you succumb to that, then you truly die before you die. And I was never going to do that. Never. And that's what Provincetown has sincerely afforded me is that sense of you're more than the disease. You're still a human being, and clearly that's what's occurred. <laughs> you know, we're people living with AIDS. We're not dying from AIDS. We're living with it. Provincetown will soon start building its AIDS memorial on the town hall green. It will honor those who've passed and those who supported them through the crisis. Among them are the people whose voices you just heard. Stephen Kovacev, Janice Walk, Tim McCarthy, Jimmy Rand, Bill Ferdin, and George LeBone. The town was brave. You know, it took on all kinds of unknowns. And I'm so proud to live here. Sophie Kazis produced that piece at the Transom Story Workshop in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrea Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. 
The digital editor is Heather Brandon. Production help this week from Dan Mozzie, Rob Rosenthal, and NPR in Washington. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music. Go to toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and WNPR.